And I'd now like to introduce our next speaker, Larry Rivkin. Larry co-founded the law firm Rivkin & Rivkin with his wife, Michelle, in 1999. They both enjoyed the counseling aspects of working with families on estate planning, particularly families with complex holdings that require more analytical problem solving. Their interest and expertise in special, trust, special needs trust grew out of their personal experience with the medical and developmental needs of their third child. From that experience, they expanded their firm's mission to include ongoing pro bono work for clients with limited financial means who are faced with the challenges and expense of raising children with special needs. Now, like Kathy, when I reached out to Larry, I had no doubts about his technical expertise and his ability to present and guide us in this session. I did not realize his personal connection to this issue until we started talking and planning for the program. So once again, we're happy he can be with us. Um, we appreciate the time he's put into this presentation, and I'd like to welcome Larry. Thanks. Well, uh, thank you to Anna and everybody at Altair for putting together what, such an interesting event. Uh, as all of you know and we know in our practice, uh, it's actually much harder to find a family today that hasn't been touched by some of these issues than to, um, to find one that has. It, it, it hits uh, so many of us, uh, and I'm honored to be here to present. I also want to thank those of you who sent in questions in advance. That was really helpful in guiding what we're going to talk about. Of course, we could talk for hours, uh, as the other speakers could, about some of these issues, and we'll compress it as best we can and focus on some of the issues that are very specific to families that have a child, a grandchild, a sibling, a niece or nephew that, that has special needs. Um, if you have questions as I go, feel free to ask. If it's something that I can answer sort of in the pace of the presentation, I'll do it. If not, I'll be around for lunch, and I'll just mention to, to see me after. Okay, and as, as Anna noted, we, we come at it both professionally and personally. And um, I've been practicing estate planning and estate and trust administration for 23 years. Uh, and actually, we had started doing a lot of special needs planning work about 18 years ago, and then three years after, uh, when our third child was born, uh, he had a brain injury at birth and eight brain surgeries the first year of life. So those of you who have been through crisis Periods of time, you know, we, we, we relate, and he's now 14, doing quite well, given where he started, but one of the things we've seen is how things evolve over time, and the solutions you have for particular problems today may be very different than the solutions you're looking at three years from now or five years from now, so it's made it a much more uh, personal practice for us. Of course, we could talk a lot about all different estate planning issues, but I'm really going to focus on how supplemental needs trust plays into planning for some families, and to the extent we have time, a little bit about guardianship at the end. And so we'll start, before we talk about supplemental needs trusts themselves, a little bit of background on public benefits and how they relate. So there are four main public benefit programs, and there are assorted side programs. But of the main programs, we find it helpful to divide them really in two ways, uh, both uh, dividing between those that are means-tested and those that are non-means tested, and those that provide a monthly income, and those that are more geared toward either medical or providing residential uh, care and placement. The ones that are non-means tested are SSDI, uh, often referred to as, uh, well, it's referred to as SSDI, but it's Social Security Disability Income, and it's a, it's a monthly amount based on somebody's work history or the work history of a retired, disabled or deceased parent, and importantly, it is based solely on whether somebody has a qualifying disability and if they fit into one of those categories. It is not based at all on whether they have assets available to pay, okay? Likewise, Medicare, we think of as comprehensive medical care for those uh, 65 and over, but it's also comprehensive medical care for those who have qualified for SSDI because of a disability, two years after qualifying, they can get Medicare, which can be hugely helpful for the cost of, of effectively comprehensive health insurance, okay? So those are the two on the non-means-tested side. The two on the means-tested side are SSI, Supplemental Security Income, that to, like SSDI is a monthly amount, and Medicaid is, it really now is, is bifurcated, but traditional Medicaid 
would provide both medical care for those who did not have means uh, and also nursing home or residential facility placement, which is really the expensive piece. You know, the, the monthly amounts from SSDI or SSI are, are really helpful for the families that don't have any assets. But Medicaid can be the key piece if it's going to be 80000 or 100000 a year to live in a facility. Okay? There is, with the Affordable Care Act, Medicaid was expanded in many states, including Illinois, to provide you know, more basic medical care. And the expansion of Medicaid is income-based, not asset-based. So qualifying for that expansion of Medicaid for medical care is not going to be driven by assets. When I talk about it, though, in the context of supplemental needs trusts, I'm going to be referring to traditional Medicaid, in particular for an individual who won't always be able to live with a, you know, in, in, with a family member or on their own and may need to live in a facility where the cost can be very expensive and having Medicaid can be hugely valuable. Okay? As a matter of qualifying for, as, for having a, a qualifying disability, the key term is whether somebody has a disability uh, that uh, is expected to last at least a year and prevents them from engaging in substantial gainful activity due to that disability, okay? Substantial gainful activity is effectively the ability to work in any job in the economy, okay, that pays more than in 2018, it's $1,180 a month. So a little under $14,000 a year, okay? If somebody can can work at a job that pays quite modestly, but more than that amount, then they're generally not going to be eligible for these programs. But if they are eligible, then the question is, on the means-tested side, how do we make sure that the family's estate planning doesn't jeopardize their eligibility to get benefits? There we go. Okay. So um, the question is, on the means-tested programs, um, what, what is an individual able to have and still be eligible for benefits if they otherwise have a qualified disability, okay? You can have a grand total of up to $2,000 in the bank. Uh, in some cases, you can actually own a home if you're able to live in the home and maybe get Medicaid services provided to you. For most people, that doesn't uh, apply. You can have personal effects and household goods, so it's okay that you have more than $2,000 worth of stuff you know, whether it's a phone, computer, music, et cetera. Uh, you can have a car. You can have a little bit of life insurance. You could have some prepaid burial funds. Uh, you can have property that you need for a profession. Uh, now, over the last couple of years, and we'll talk more about it later, you can have what's called an ABLE account, Achieving Better Life uh, Act account. Uh, you can be a beneficiary of a 529 plan up to a certain point in time. Uh, but you have to be careful with those because it could easily flip to you being the owner and have you be not eligible. And a properly crafted supplemental needs trust for your benefit also can be exempt, and we'll be talking a lot more about that. Okay, that's better. So the landscape has changed a lot over the last generation. Uh, a generation ago, before we had good law on supplemental needs trusts, the choices for parents, grandparents, et cetera, who wanted to provide for a loved one with special needs were pretty limited. Uh, they could leave an inheritance for that child or that grandchild, knowing that once that child or grandchild receives the inheritance, it doesn't have to be outright. It could be in a traditional trust for their health, their support, their education. They're not going to be eligible, eligible to a uh, access these programs. So one possibility was, you know what, I'd rather have them have a trust that can pay for these things and forego the public benefits and so I'll do that. The alternative would be to say, no, I really want them to be able to access the benefits. If they need to le live in a facility most of their life, I want Medicaid to pay if possible, and so maybe I'll leave assets to their brother or sister in the hope that the brother or sister will always use those assets to take care of them. Sometimes that worked, and as you can imagine, life evolves in funny ways, and uh, the brother or sister who maybe at one point in time was in a position and, and amenable to helping at another point in time or with a spouse's involvement wasn't. So it was never a great alternative, but it was the alternative that families had at that point in time. Uh, now we've got a few different options. In terms of supplemental needs trusts, we have both what we consider third-party trusts, 
That is trusts that are funded entirely by parent, grandparent, guardian, uh, uh, parent, grandparent, sibling, aunt or uncle, uh, family members. And we have trusts that are self-funded. And when we say self-funded, we mean that are funded by the individual with a disability themselves. Maybe they've uh, already inherited funds. Maybe they've earned a bunch of money before they had an accident that created the disability. Maybe they, they had a, a lawsuit settlement, whatever it was. And so we talk about first party trust. That now is available under the law as well with some different rules. We also now have ABLE accounts, which we'll talk about. And then finally, and I, this uh, obviously is still a, a source of some public debate as to how it's going to play out over time. With the Affordable Care Act, uh, we no longer have the issue, at least for now, that many families face of thinking, okay, I have a child with a significant disability. If they can't um, access health insurance through a job because they're just not equipped to get the kind of job that'll help health insurance, how in the world are they ever going to qualify for an individual health care policy where there's underwriting? Okay? So uh, for, for the community of, of families for whom this is a really serious issue, the, uh, the elimination of underwriting for pre-existing conditions under the Affordable Care Act became hugely valuable. And whether it's through private policies or through Medicaid expansion for those states that have done it, it has added an opportunity to potentially be sure that your child or grandchild can get health insurance without necessarily having access to what I call traditional Medicaid to do it and have them be impoverished to access it. Okay, so when might someone consider a supplemental needs trust for a, uh, a child or a grandchild? And I guess the first question is, does the loved one have a disability that might qualify them for means-tested public benefits? If not, even if it's a disability, uh, but maybe they, ha they are high enough functioning that they're going to be able to work and make $25,000 a year, more than the, the SGA threshold, uh, a supplemental lease trust isn't going to necessarily help them. Are there significant assets to protect? Uh, if a family has you know, little in the way of assets, uh, they're probably better off not spending the money and the, and the burden creating a supplemental needs trust, but relying on the hope that, that Medicaid or other programs will be there. But where there is equity in a home, life insurance, 401k, or other assets within the family, uh, if the trust is there to protect it. And then would their family prefer to self-fund? Some families say, I know that my child or grandchild might be able to get Medicaid or SSI, but I'd rather us pay for it, um, which is uh, a perfectly reasonable decision for many families. There are some programs that are Medicaid-specific programs, like work, um, work training programs that are open only to those that have Medicaid. My understanding is that there are uh, greater self-funding options now. Mo those more of those programs are accepting self-funding from families that can self-fund, but there are clearly some programs that are open only to, to Medicaid recipients. So sometimes families will say, I, want to s I would prefer to self-fund, but I also like my child or grandchild to be able to get Medicaid so that they can access any program that's available only to Medicaid recipients. We talked before about the distinction between third-party funded trust and self-funded trust. Uh, third-party funded trust, in Illinois you'll often hear these referred to as 15.1 trust after the section in the Illinois Trust and Trustees Act that effectively authorizes them. And these are trusts that are funded directly either during life or at death by people other than the individual beneficiary that has disabilities. So typically the parents, grandparents, siblings, etc. cetera. And the, uh, the, the important thing is that the money never goes from them to the individual with the disability. It goes from them right into the trust. That's what makes it third party funded. And if it's third party funded and properly done, then, uh, then those assets are exempt when determining whether the child is eligible for means-tested public benefits, whether it's $10,000 in that trust or a million dollars or $5 million, at least for now, there's, there's no distinction. And importantly, if it's entirely third-party funded, the trust does not have to include a provision that specifies a payback to Medicaid for anything Medicaid pays during the beneficiary's life at the time of the beneficiary's death. So the trust can say, while my child or grandchild is alive, trustee, please provide for their supplemental needs. And if there's anything left at their death, 
here's who, where I want it to go. I have you know, other children, other grandchildren, and we don't have to worry about paying back the public authorities first. All right. There are two types of self-funded trusts. These are trusts where you have a, a, an individual with disability who already either has assets in their own name or assets that are effectively considered vested in them. Okay, maybe there's a, a UTMA custodial account. Okay, it's already their money in the eyes of the law. Or maybe there's a trust for them that provides for their health, their support, their education, or they have a withdrawal right. The typical types of trusts that you know, those of us who, who practice in estate planning do spend most of our, our days dealing with. So the, the, the assets are already there in effect vested in the individual, but now the individual is trying to plan for public benefits. And the first type of trust uh, has, goes by various names. Sometimes you'll hear it referred to as an OBRA trust. Sometimes you'll hear it referred to as a payback trust. Sometimes you'll hear it referred to as a uh, D4A trust. D4A is the section of the 1993 Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act, uh, now dating back, wow, 25 years, that authorized these kind of trusts under federal law. Okay? And they're funded with the assets, and here I use child, but it could, you know, it could be an adult, as long as they're under the age of 65, they can move assets into one of these trusts, ideally before applying for means-tested public benefits. Uh, historically, until about a year ago, these trusts had to be created by a parent, a grandparent, a legal guardian, or a court. And there was one party noticeably absent from that list, and that was the individual themselves. So you might have an individual with severe medical issues uh, who would otherwise qualify for public benefits, and they would have the wherewithal to know enough to say, I would like to create one of these trusts, but the law wouldn't allow it. Their assets could be used to fund it, but they needed to have a living parent or grandparent who was active or, or apply through a court process. Uh, through the 20th century, 21st Century Cures Act, uh, also, the subpart was the SNT Fairness Act. Uh, within the last couple of years, that was expanded to allow an individual with a disability to create their own D4A trust. Very, very helpful. Okay? As with a third party trust, those, the assets in one of these trusts are exempt from uh, questions of public benefit eligibility during the beneficiary's life. The one difference is if there's anything left when the beneficiary dies, Medicaid has to get paid back for anything it paid during life first before it goes to other family members. So if you have a, an individual with both types of trusts, a third-party trust and a self-funded trust, you would typically want to spend the, the self-funded trust assets first because that's the one that's going to be subject to payback. Okay, so the section option uh, named after the, the provision two letters after it in the same 1993 Act is a D4C trust also known as a pooled trust. Um, how many of you are familiar with donor-advised charitable funds? Okay, a lot of people. So D4C trusts are a little bit like a donor-advised charitable fund. It's, a, it's effectively a sub-account within an umbrella trust held by an organization like the Illinois Disability Association that serves as an umbrella manager and pools the funds for investment. So rather than a, a family having to do a private trust with a private trustee, doing all the record keeping, they, they effectively link into a broader pool, and it operates quite similarly to a D4A trust. Uh, fund assets are, are exempt if it's properly crafted for eligibility purposes while the beneficiary is alive, uh, and then there are, there are annual fees. Most of the trusts have, have a Medicaid payback, but some don't. Some have a, effectively, you can pay out to the organization itself. Typically, you're either paying back to Medicaid or the organization before it goes to other family members at death. Okay. So, a big question comes up is, all right, I, we have a family member that has a, uh, a disability that we think will qualify them for public benefits, when do we create these trusts and when do we fund them? And there are different questions. So, you know, for many family members, uh, it'll be appropriate to create a third-party trust, a 15.1 trust, as part of their estate plan. Uh, because it's, uh, for, for the estate planners in the audience and me, we spend a lot of time dealing in the hypothetical of, 
uh, the worst case. You, you pass away tomorrow or in six months or in a year, and none of us know when that time's going to be. And so if you've got a child or a grandchild or a sibling that might need one of these trusts, the idea is to have it in place, even if unfunded, now, you know, as part of, as part of your estate plan. But typically, in most cases, we tell families don't fund it now because once you fund it, you're subject to all the restrictions of that trust. Better to hold the assets and be able to spend it how you, know, you, you feel is appropriate for your child, your grandchild, or, or you know, whoever it is in your family. And uh, unlike other types of trusts for a family member, contributions to a supplemental needs trust don't qualify for the gift tax annual exclusion. The, the $15,000 annual amount used to be $10,000, and that's being indexed because the sort of provision that you would need to put in one of these trusts to qualify it, uh, typically, you know, for those who are familiar, uh, crummy withdrawal rights that give a beneficiary a short-term right to withdraw, jeopardizes exactly what you're trying to say to the public benefit authorities that this trust is doing, that the, that the beneficiary has no right or access over these. So usually with the 15.1 trust, you say create it now, build it into your estate plan, and make sure that assets under the estate plan are directed to it, um, but typically don't fund it now. A D4A trust is different. Uh, the question is, do you create it now? Uh, the hope is for families that are planning ahead, it's never going to be needed if the, if the child or other individual with a disability doesn't have assets, they're never going to have it. And so maybe we don't even need it. Um, but if they have assets, the funding would be now before they, uh, before they apply for benefits. Or if they're already receiving benefits and a family member inadvertently left them assets by inheritance, it's you get those assets and immediately fund it. And the rules we won't get into now, but there are a whole series of rules about how that happens. Okay? We used to routinely talk to families that did a third-party trust about doing a, a D4A trust at the same time, just as a safety valve. We know the parent or grandparent is alive. Um, we do that less often now for a few reasons. One is the Social Security Administration in particular has uh, become much more stringent on the rules for these made it much more difficult. And we have other options. If the child is high-functioning enough, they potentially can create their own D4A trust uh, when they're older if they need it, which they couldn't do before the recent law change. ABLE accounts are possible. Pooled funds are possible. So uh, it's more case-by-case. Case. OK, so primary terms of a supplemental needs trust. I think how it differs from a, a more standard type of trust that most of us are used to you know, generally to be safe, we're saying distributions should only be for the quote-unquote supplemental needs of the beneficiary. That is, those needs that are above and beyond what the government is paying. And if the government is paying basic food, shelter, medical care, it's for everything above and beyond. It doesn't mean that it can't be used at all for shelter or medical care, but it's got to be supplemental to what the government's paying. And there are rules that could reduce the monthly amount that the government's paying if if the trust provides for some of these things. But again, the idea, that's where the name supplemental needs comes from. Uh, importantly, the distributions are to be directly to providers of goods and services. So unlike a typical trust that might provide, give the trustee leeway to give a beneficiary $2,000 a month toward their living needs, okay? And then the beneficiary can use it as they wish. With a supplemental needs trust, typically uh, that should be avoided and the trustee will have to pay for things directly. It makes it a much more difficult job for the trustee. You know, they could, they could pay for uh, a computer. They could pay for a job program. They could pay for entertainment. They could pay for educational stuff, but the trustee needs to be actively involved paying. Okay. Uh, you would typically want to name remainder beneficiaries if there are assets left at the death of the beneficiary. In the case of a D4A trust, it would be after... Medicaid is reimbursed. And of course, of great importance is who are going to be the trustees and the successor trustees. And it's not easy. So uh, some of these issues in choosing a trustee are, are for any type of trust, including for a trust for, for an individual with special needs where the family decides a special needs trust isn't appropriate. But we certainly need a, tr a trust with a trustee who will preserve and protect, and then spend the assets for the benefit of that beneficiary. And the question is, OK, how do we select trustees? OK, uh, if it's individuals, are they willing to take on that big burden? 
Do they have the time? Particularly with a supplemental needs trust where you've got to be actively involved paying for things. Are they local to where the child's going to be so that they can stay actively involved in the beneficiary's life? And do they have the ability? Do they have enough financial savvy to know what they know and what they don't know and get appropriate help from excellent fin financial advisors along the way? So that's, that's one option. The other option is a corporate fiduciary. Okay? Um, if you get to the right one, you've got the benefit of a professional organization with experience. Of course, there will be fees, although any trustee is entitled to fees. You t often families find that it's, it's going to be higher with a corporate trustee. Um, what is difficult in this area is that many banks and trust companies have made the decision that supplemental needs trusts are too complicated for them. And so they just won't serve. Okay? <laughs> Bank of America has a, uh, a, a fine, large trust company, but they've made a decision. We're just not going to take supplemental needs trust. It's too much liability risk. It's, um, we're just not going to do it. So it, it can be more difficult. There are some nice small trust companies, some of whom come at it from the end of uh, a disability education and advocacy. Uh, some of you may be familiar with PACT, Inc., or Day One PACT, that's local. Um, Life's Plan, Inc. is local. And they'll often work with um, a family's financial advisors, like an Altair, who will still be able to manage the investments. And day one pact or life's plan will, will be the, the trustee making the decisions on distributions and being mindful of the special needs rules. Uh, but it's, you know, it's, it's a hard question, getting the right trustee. Uh, a trustee is not the same as a guardian. Okay? A guardian is the person or persons who's in charge of taking care of the day-to-day -day care. Of, a, of an individual, an individual under 18 without a, without a parent, and then it could be an individual over 18 who's, uh, who's disabled and can't make decisions for themselves. And some people like having the trustee and the guardian be the same, or it makes sense. Sometimes families want checks and balances. Typically, we tell families, pick the best person or institution for each role, when if they love your child, and that's why you're picking them, if it's an individual, they'll find a way to make it work. Okay. If you have a supplemental needs trust, okay, some permissible distributions, and this list can go on for pages and pages. It's basically everything other than, you know, those things that the public benefits are paying, but supplemental needs trust can pay for dental care. It can pay for eye care, supplemental nursing care, computers and electronic devices, expenditures for travel, recreation, education, or cultural experiences, and on and on and on. So it's pretty broad. I, so uh, if you fund a special needs trust, you don't have to worry that it's so limited in what it can be spent for. The real restriction is the need for a trustee to be paying these things directly. Okay. So a, a question that often comes up for families where there's, let's say, uh, like ours. We have uh, three children. Uh, our youngest you know, had a significant medical issue at birth. He will probably always have more needs than his siblings. And we think, okay, what's, how do we make sure he's provided for while also making sure our other kids provide, are provided for and keeping in mind all those intangible issues of perceptions of fairness and in, in families that have a child with special needs, you know, it's so important to try and preserve as best you can the relationships among siblings. So if you're a parent and you're thinking about your children, one of whom has a significant special need, and you're not going to be here forever, but you, the likelihood is your other children will, um, you want to be mindful that they don't walk away after your death feeling slighted and feeling resentful. So how do you balance that? And there's no perfect answer. It's just hard, and every family's different. Here are some ways that we've seen families do it uh, that you know, have given them a comfort level. One is just to say, we're going to divide assets equally. I mean, that's, even though the kids are differently situated, that's just what we feel is right. And hopefully there's enough money in the family that it'll, there will be enough for everyone. And if not, maybe the siblings will, will step forward. Um, another way to do it would be to say, you know what? This particular child is going to need a base amount for the rest of their life. So let's say it's $2 million. All right, we're going to put the first $2 million aside for this child. And then everything else will do equally. And at least then we know that this child is, is provided for. And maybe what we'll do is get a life insurance policy to fund it. 
So, you know, often in the world of estate planning, we've thought about with married couples second to die life insurance to provide liquidity to pay estate taxes. Um, that market is getting a little bit smaller as the estate tax exemptions have gone way higher. But this is a, a, a different sort of need for married couples to have second to die life insurance or for for single people to have a policy maybe to cover that base amount. Um, another possibility would be uh, to um, provide a, a base amount for uh, the child with special needs and say, you know what, that's going to be enough. Their life, they're never going to be, you know, potentially starting a business that could be a, you know, a fabulously successful enterprise. It's just not part of their life. We need, they're going to need to have a base amount, but beyond that, that's all. And so they'll get the base amount, and the other kids will get the rest, whether it's more or less than that child received. Um, another possibility was to do the base amount for the one child and then do an equalizing amount for the other children so you bring everybody up to the same amount if there's enough assets, and then divide equally. And there's many more ways. Uh, but it's, it's certainly worth thinking about how you do that in a way that protects you know, all the children or, or grandchildren. Okay. Coordinating with other estate planning documents. So um, we want to make sure that if you're doing planning that uh, if you do a supplemental needs trust, it's not in isolation. If it's intended to be funded at death, you need to make sure that the wills and trusts and other documents properly allocate the assets to the supplemental needs trust. Okay? If the supplemental needs trust is standing by itself and it never gets funded, it doesn't do any good. And whether that's uh, parents, grandparents, whomever, for grandparents, um, you know, well, sometimes the initial reaction is, well, I'm leaving everything for my children, so I don't need to worry about this. But many grandparents say, yes, I leave assets for my children, but if any child is not alive, their share goes to their children. Well, if one of, their, one of the grandchildren has a supplemental needs trust, then you at least need to build in that if the child is not living and it goes to their children, the one grandchild's portion goes into the supplemental needs trust. If you've got life insurance or retirement plans that aren't passing directly through a will or trust, you need to make sure that if you have a child or grandchild with special needs and they have a special needs trust, that they're not named as beneficiary or that there is a beneficiary at all. You don't want them to be the default beneficiary. And so you've got to appropriately have the, the trust as a, the beneficiary. Again, no assets should pass directly to the child. All assets should be allocated directly to the, again, the 15.1 supplemental needs trust, the trust that's intended to be third-party assets. On this issue, we find it really important, if a family is going to use a supplemental needs trust, to have it be a standalone document. By that, I mean, instead of saying, okay, well, we have wills, and in our wills it says, when we die, here's how we divide up the assets. And for our one child, um, here's an article within our will that talks about the special needs trust aspect of their trust. That's okay, but that trust isn't in place until you, you die. And so what if another family member wants to leave assets to it? It's not there yet. But if you have a standalone trust that's just for the child or grandchild, and it's a special needs trust, it's available anytime it needs to be funded. In addition, the... the uh, People at uh, the Social Security Administration and, and Medicaid that review these trusts tend to be pretty picky about what they're looking for. And often they'll pick out quite arbitrary provisions and say, we don't like these. It may have nothing to do with the trust. It may be part of the boilerplate. And if you do a, uh, a, a supplemental needs trust by itself, it's much easier to strip out all those provisions that might be deemed problematic than if you have a standard will or living trust that has all the boilerplate that you otherwise want. So uh, definitely would pitch having, having this supplemental needs trust be uh, by itself. All right, so what are some things that can go wrong? And this comes from some of the questions we received. There are a lot of things, but I would say as a starting point, well, the basic issue is these trusts should not talk about health, support, maintenance, the way a traditional trust would. Okay, it either should have no standard at all just provide any amounts that the trustee in their discretion deems desirable. But better than that, it's, it's appropriate and important for the trust to provide specifically for the supplemental needs, the needs above and beyond what public benefits would pay uh, for the beneficiary. Um, and, and even though there should be nothing wrong under the law with authorizing distributions to the beneficiary, in contrast to distributions for the benefit of the beneficiary, uh, 
unless there are actual distributions made to the beneficiary, the, that's, at least in Illinois, our experience has been the Social Security Administration, if they see the word to, they'll knock it out. Okay? No matter what the law says about it, they're going to knock it out. So any supplemental needs trust should only provide for the benefit of. And again, that gets back to the trustee paying providers of goods and services directly. Um, we talk about seemingly benign provisions can be deemed to run afoul of ever-changing regulations and interpretation. We had one of our trusts called last year because it had a long list of financial powers. And those of you who deal with trusts can imagine a trust with a couple pages of you know, investing in this and that and selling assets. And one of the financial powers was merging this trust with a substantially similar trust. Okay? Very standard power. And not only is it standard power, it mirrors what's under the Illinois Trust and Trustees Act. And the Social Security Administration said, nope, we don't like that provision because we think it gives the opportunity to, to terminate the trust while the beneficiary is alive without a Medicaid payback. Therefore, we're going to say this trust doesn't work. Okay? Um, I can't predict anymore what the Social Security Administration in particular is going to try and pick out. So it's highly important that any trust that's a supplemental needs trust have a provision authorizing the trustee to amend the trust in order to, to comply with public benefit rules. Uh, and importantly on this, this, the Social Security Administration had passed internal guidance a couple years ago that said if a trust is deemed to be not, to non-exempt, then the Social Security Administration is required upon request to, to say what provision they find offensive and what provision of their operating manual they think it, it violates. And sometimes you've got to push to get that. Uh, we've seen situations where they don't want to give up that information, but it's now part of their internal rules to do it. Okay. What can go wrong in terms of administration of these trusts? There we go. Um, you've got to be careful to avoid mixing first and third party funds. Okay? In particular, if parents or grandparents set up a trust that's intended to be a third party trust, make sure that the child's own assets don't go into it. Or uniform transfers to minors to act assets don't go into it. Um, so it's important that, to keep the, that distinction. If a parent or grandparent creates a, a D4A or a payback trust, one of the, I think, pretty arbitrary rules that has come out the last few years is that it has to be quote unquote seeded by the parent or grandparent to qualify. Okay? And it's not enough to write on the last page of the trust as trusts are quite commonly done in Illinois to show that it has assets, $10 or $20 or $1. They want to see actual money going into the trust from the parent or grandparent, even though the whole purpose of the D4A trust is to be funded with the child's own assets. Okay? Now, it's not an issue under the new law if the child themselves creates the trust. You don't have the seating issue because they're going to be the ones funding it. But if it's a parent or grandparent creating the payback trust, again, for the child's assets, you've got to be careful about seating. If it's the parent or grandparent or sibling creating it for their own assets, a third-party trust, this is not an issue. Okay. Uh, SSI or employment funds of the, of the beneficiary should not be added to the trust. They should be spent for the beneficiary's you know, health and support and not added back to one of these trusts. And funds should not be used for food and shelter from the trust before the public, public benefits have been exhausted. The whole idea is that these trusts are for, for supplemental needs above and beyond what the government is paying. Uh, the, particularly in the case of a payback trust, it's supposed to be for the sole benefit of the person with special needs, and so you can't be paying for other people's expenses. For years, many of us who did this kind of work would include a provision saying that the trust could pay for the travel expenses of a family member to come visit. Okay? In our minds, clearly for the benefit of that beneficiary to, have, to keep that closeness with their family or close friends, and now with, with some very narrow limitations, um, you, you can't do that. And uh, finally, uh, if you have one of these trusts, particularly a payback trust, You've, you've got to disclose the trust and its funding. Uh, and the, the authorities are going to want to, this is to Medicaid and or Social Security if the individual either is applying for SSI or Medicaid or is already receiving it. All right, what do you do if there's an existing trust and it's problematic? Well, if it's, if it's a trust that has never been funded, so as part of your, somebody's estate plan, they do a third-party supplemental needs trust, and they realize, you know what, I don't like the trustees, I don't like the remainder beneficiaries, or oops, there are some provisions here that maybe won't pass muster when the time comes. If it hasn't been funded, not such a big deal. If there's an, uh, an ability to amend it, 
uh, you can amend it. If not, you just create a brand new trust and just make sure that whatever other documents, wills, trusts, life insurance beneficiary designations, retirement plan beneficiary designations are funding it, um, are updated to direct assets to the new trust. What if it's already funded, okay, and there are assets in it? Um, then it's a question of what does the trust document allow or what does trust law allow and whether it's, in, let's say, Illinois, if it's a trust government by Illinois law. Maybe the document allows an amendment. Um, you know, I think it's important if you have a supplemental needs trust to have a provision to allow for amendment to comply with, uh, with the rules. Uh, might it be possible to merge with another trust, uh, particularly a third party supplemental needs trust where we don't get into this so benefit rule, if there's a good merger provision or maybe under state law, you've got the ability to merge with another trust with substantially similar provisions. Um, Illinois now and many other states over the last few years have passed uh, what we call decanting statutes that say even if the trust document doesn't have a provision for moving assets from one trust to another under circ certain circumstances, and in particular if the beneficiary is a, uh, a child or an adult with special needs, the ability to, to transfer it to a special needs trust. And sometimes, maybe the best answer is to distribute. Maybe you have a beneficiary who, at an earlier point in life, um, prospects weren't so good, and they've uh, far exceeded everybody's expectations. You know, and they don't need this anymore, and there might be a way to get assets out. Okay, what are some alternatives to supplemental lease trust? Well, certainly a, a, a trust for, for the health support education of a of the beneficiary, standard type of trust, and you say, I'd rather be able to cover these things, I'd rather be able to distribute directly to the beneficiary and not worry about all these restrictions of a supplemental needs trust, recognizing that if the, the, uh, the beneficiary applies for means-tested benefits, assets in these type of trusts will be um, considered available to them. They won't be exempt. Uh, a trust for a child with total trustee discretion without reference to provisions like health and support. Some people in the, in the community of estate planners who do a lot of supplemental needs trust planning say, this is the way you should do it. Don't mention supplemental needs, okay? Just say the trustee has total discretion. I think that works better in other states than in Illinois, you know, from what we've seen of the reviewers at Social Security or Medicaid, but it, it may be a possibility in some situations and whether or not you're trying to apply for benefits. And then finally, ABLE accounts. And again, we'll talk more about it in a, in a minute, at least for a smaller amount of money can be a really nice vehicle. All right, so let's talk about ABLE accounts. Uh, th these came into effect a, uh, a couple of years ago. And the idea was to provide another means to get assets for an individual with disabilities where, where they don't have to have a trustee who's paying for things for them. It gives them a little bit more independence. And the idea is that if you're familiar with 529 college savings plans, they're similar. You have a tax-advantaged account that as long as the money is used ultimately for what are quote-unquote qualifying disability expenses, then there's no income tax on the earnings, okay? Uh, interest, dividends, capital gains. And they are available to those that have, and the term and the law is marked, and severe functional limita limitations beginning before age 26. So if somebody has a, uh, an accident over 26, they're not available, although there's been some uh, proposals to, to change that. Uh, we talked about the earnings being exempt from income tax if they're used for disability expenses. And right now, there's an annual contribution limit from all sources. So that 15,000 that we're used to, the rule we're used to is 15,000 from any one donor to any one donee in a year. ABLE accounts is a little different. It's 15,000 from all donors to the ABLE account of one beneficiary for the year, okay? But it still can be funded. Up to $100,000 won't count when determining SSI eligibility, and a lot higher number when determining Medicaid eligibility, okay? There is still some question with these various accounts uh, in different states whether there's gonna be Medicaid reimbursement at death. Assume, assume yes, but there hopefully, you know, ultimately will flesh out that it won't be. Uh, these accounts came into place in 2016, and under the recent tax act, the rules were liberalized. Uh, there's a savers tax credit that could be available to an individual with disabilities that funds their own. And if they have employment earnings, sometimes they can go over the 15,000 a year. And if parents or grandparents created a 529 plan, college savings plan for a child, and it turns out that child's disabilities are more significant or maybe arose later than the family realized, you can roll over 529 plan money to enable account up to 15,000 a year. 
And so it's a way to convert it. And it's very, very helpful. Um, there we go, in between cases. So there are a lot of these. And frankly, my, my son fits into, into this kind of situation. You have a beneficiary who um, clearly has needs. They maybe will never be able to live fully independently, but they might be able to live semi-independently. They may be able to work and fund you know, part of their own needs. And so we don't know yet whether a supplemental needs trust is going to be right for them. We don't know whether we want those restrictions. And so what do you do in those cases? And one question is, well, could you self-fund if you needed to? You know, is there enough assets that, again, subject to this issue of some programs only being available for Medicaid recipients, is there enough there that you say, okay, if they don't get benefits, they don't get benefits, but we're going to take the optimistic view and, we're, and, and just have a more traditional type of trust, maybe with a trustee for their lifetime. You know, maybe they're never going to be able to be their own trustee or withdraw the money, but we're not going to put the restrictions on a supplemental needs trust. And it's a hard question. Do you err on the side of flexibility for the individual and don't do a supplemental needs trust? but perhaps include broader provisions within a standard type of trust to authorize the trustee to effectively do what the decanting statute will do in some cases, but without having to go through that statute, to say to the trustee, if it's appropriate, you can move the assets from this trust to a new supplemental needs trust that gets created for this beneficiary. It may not always work. The public benefit authorities might want to track back to what they have, but it might work, and it gives more flexibility. The other option is to err on the other side, err on the side of protection, and leave assets to a supplemental needs trust knowing that there'll be restrictions on distribution, but at least the funds can be used for almost anything and, and the public benefits will be preserved. Hard, it's a hard question. And the answer for the same beneficiary at one point in their life might be different than it is three years later or five years later or 10 years later, and we're certainly seeing that in our own family. Um, some situations requiring special attention, uh, and I'm just going to touch on them just so that you can flag the issue. If, if someone has a spouse with a significant disability, maybe they got very early dementia. You know, they're, they're in their upper 40s and had an illness that had it. Can you do a supplemental needs trust for them? Yes, but uh, the rules are, are quite particular and in particular. In particular, one of the rules in Illinois is you have to fund that under a will. Uh, so it would be a will that, that, that funds it. Um, what if uh, there was a personal injury or medical malpractice settlement? Maybe there was a, a doctor error at birth. Well, then you've got to work with the, the personal injury attorney or med mal attorney in the court to direct the settlement into a supplemental needs trust, and that's its own little field. Um, what about... Child support, if you have a child over 18 that the court continues to pay child support to because of a disability, can you direct that child support into a D4A payback trust? Yes, but you, but you have to get the court's involvement and it should be a D4A trust, not a 15.1 trust. Um, what about if the parents are divorced? And the, one of the sad realities of, of the world of families with kids with special needs is that the divorce rate is higher in Illinois, often much higher. And how do you coordinate? Do you need two supplemental needs trusts? Can you have one supplemental needs trust and everybody agree? No perfect answer, but it's a, it's a challenging issue. Uh, and then what if there's a conflict between the parent and grandparent and the child? <laughs> so we had a situation where the parents and grandparents want to provide these assets, but also want to take the assets that are already there. You know, maybe they've done a lot of estate planning and there are a bunch of assets already effectively in the child's name or vested in the child, and they want to do a D4A trust and they want the child to transfer those, that, you know, sign off on transferring the assets to the D4A trust so they could qualify for the benefits. And the child says, no, I don't want to do that. You know, I don't, I don't want to lose control over these. Well, again, that's a, an issue for the family to navigate uh, with their advisors. Uh, I'll touch just very briefly on, on guardianship. Uh, there are you know, two main types of guardianship, guardian of the person making care decisions, guardian of the estate managing the assets of of an individual with a disability or a minor. Now again, if assets are in a trust, the guardian of the estate doesn't manage those assets. Maybe they sign off on it, but these are assets that are in the, the child or other beneficiary's name. You've got um, a plenary guardian, which has sort of complete authority. If you have an individual who really can't make any medical or financial decisions for themselves, and then you have a limited guardian. Maybe you have a, 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 a high-functioning but 
uh, not completely independent individual who needs a guardian for some things but not others. So when is, uh, you do you need a guardianship? Well, if there's an inability for, for a child to make decisions once they've reached 18, if they're a minor always, if there's no parent, but over 18, if there's no inability to make decisions or communicate decisions as a result of mental deterioration, physical incapacity, mental illness, developmental disability. Um, are there alternatives? Uh, in many cases, yes, and it just depends on the, the situation. For financial decisions, if, you know, if you've got a, a child over 18, and maybe it's a child who's on the autism spectrum but is high functioning and is cooperative with mom and dad, and they want to keep mom and dad involved after 18, but they have, an, they have enough understanding to say, yeah, I know what a power of attorney is, and yes, I want mom and dad to be involved. And so without having to do a, a guardianship, maybe they can do a power of attorney for property, maybe a living trust. If they're going to get SSI or SSDI, they can name a parent as their representative payee. Okay? It won't work in every case because sometimes a child won't, won't have the, well, the representative payee will, but the property power of attorney or living trust um, because maybe they don't, they don't have the wherewithal to do it. The other issue is if you have, you know, particularly in situations where you have a, a young adult who's struggling with mental illness, okay, and maybe it's schizophrenia or bipolar disorder or, or something, and at the moment they're cooperative and they'll do a property power of attorney, but in two years they might not be. A property power of attorney can be ripped up. A guardianship goes through a court, and you have to undo it through a court if, if you want to get rid of it. So it just depends on the circumstance. Okay, for medical care, again, if you've got a, uh, an individual who's 18 or older they can do, and they have the capacity, they can do a health care power of attorney. If they don't have c capacity at all and they've never done a health care power of attorney and it's clear they can't make their own decisions, there is a priority under Illinois law under the Health Care Surrogate Act of family members who can make decisions for them. Uh, just to, within the last couple of minutes, uh, I'll go through a, a, a few other things. In terms of the guardianship process, um, it's, n it's not a, a, a super easy process, although it depends on the family and depends on the child's situation. Typically, um, if you're going to be appointed guardian because the alternatives won't work in a particular case, you petition the court, you attach the position, uh, to the petition a physician's report, you know, a doctor who's involved in examining the, the individual, maybe a neurologist in certain situations who can explain their diagnosis and why the individual can't make decisions for themselves. Even if they sometimes present as if they can, uh, if their decision-making capacity isn't there. And then the, the guardian has to take an oath of office and in some cases post a bond if it's for the estate. Uh, the process would, after the petition, um, there's a summons. Some, if a guardianship is actually taking away the, uh, what would otherwise be legal rights of a, of a young adult. And a sheriff comes and delivers a, a summons, or maybe you have to go to the office and get a summons. And so set, definitely something you want to prepare for. We've had some families that say, that's exciting. They love the idea of a, you know, bring the police car with the sirens going. That'll be, that'll be fun. And other families say, no, that would really, really you know, freak our, our son or daughter out. But you want to prepare for it ahead. And obviously, if you can do an alternative to guardianship and avoid all this, all the better. It just doesn't work in every case. Uh, a notice of the hearing is given to close relatives and to, the, of course, the child themselves and the proposed guardian. And, you know, sometimes it's tricky. If, it's, if there's a divorce and one parent wants the guardianship and the other objects, or if one sibling is petitioning for guardianship and the other siblings object, it can be tricky because other, other family members can come in and tell the court, no, we don't think this is right. Either they don't need a guardian or this is the wrong guardian. Uh, the judge has a hearing. They typically will appoint a guardian ad litem, a, a friend of the court, to go out and meet with the child and the family and make their own evaluation to help the court with its decision. And then the judge will decide by preponderance of the evidence, do you need a guardian? And if so, is this the right guardian? And many times, for families that have done good planning, they can do a guardian of the person Okay, maybe the child has a severe disability where they can't do a health care power of attorney. But the parents and the grandparents have done a great job of getting all the assets in trust. So they don't need a guardian of the estate because there aren't assets that the court needs to supervise. And it's, it saves a lot of the hassle of court filings if you don't have a guardian of the estate. So maybe they just get guardian of the person. And then the person can talk to doctors and make care decisions and decide on, on living arrangements. Again, so some considerations for the guardian. Would the alternative suffice and who should be the guardian? And how does that relate to the trustee? 
And then finally, some of the questions that came to us were, well, how do we know if we're getting the right advice? Um, you know, like so many things, it's become a very specialized world. And in a city of like, Chica like Chicago, there are a lot of really good, really experienced estate and trust lawyers. And there are, and you, you find the right fit for your family. There are a fewer number of, peop of lawyers who have a lot of experience with public benefits and a lot of experience with guardianship. And there are a fewer number that sort of cross between the two that, that you know, understand all the tax and trust law issues with traditional estate planning, particularly with families of means. Okay, but also the, the public benefit issues. And I think you just have to ask the questions. I know, for example, for our office, we don't do contested guardianships. We get the call all the time. We just don't have experience as litigators. And we don't even want to go down that path if we think the family is going to squabble about it or the individual themselves is going to object. Uh, so, you know, like anything else, you, you kick the tires and ask good questions. In terms of the last page, and then I'll stay around for lunch if, if you've got questions. Some things to keep in mind, um, and this might be the single most important piece, if you have a family member with a disability, particularly a child, there is so much information that you have up here that nobody else has about their habits, their routines, their, their, their doctors and therapists, um, and not just, you know, easy things to say, yeah, call this person. It's, you know, they're much better off if they go to sleep before 9 o'clock than after. Otherwise, it's a nightmare. That sort of thing. And if you can memorialize that in writing while, uh, you know, a parent is alive and healthy and thinking about it and get that down on paper and there are a few Google life care plans or letters of intent, there are a lot of them out there. Um, I put up a link to a page on our website where we have a, a, a one sample of a life care plan, and you're welcome to just download it as a Word file if you or another family member could benefit from it. But get it down on paper so that if you're not there one day and you're relying on another family member or a, a corporate fiduciary to step in, they can at least have some of the knowledge that you've got you know, up in your head to work from. Um, I don't know how many people are, are familiar with the puns list. Illinois, of course, is in terrible financial straits. There's not nearly enough funding to cover every, every individual with disabilities that needs it. But if, if there is a young, uh, you know, if a, a young child in particular uh, that is likely going to need services as, as an adult, Illinois keeps a list, priority urgent needs service list called the puns list, and there's a link on how to get on it. There's no guarantee that you'll actually get the services or that child will get the services they need when the time comes, but it'll put them higher up in the lottery to do it in a state like Illinois, terribly important. Um, uh, I know the other panelists are talking a lot about discussions within family, but I think, you know, I, as it relates to the estate planning, it's probably particularly important when there's a, a family member with special needs to communicate to the extent possible among family members. Uh, so that's it on these issues. We could have covered a lot more, but thank you for your attention. And again, if you've got individual questions, I'll be around during lunch. Mm -hmm.